everyone, Dave here for Geek Vision, and I am thrilled to be here with uh, someone you all know from Mystery Science Theater and Rift Tracks. Uh, you'll be able to catch him in a theater near you coming up June 28th at the big Mystery Science Theater reunion, Rift Tracks 10th anniversary extravaganza. Uh, as far as I know, that's the official name of it. Close enough. I am here with Kevin Murphy. How are you, sir? I am splendid, and how are you today? I am doing wonderfully. Sure. I'm doing my best uh, after dealing with all the Los Angeles traffic to find my way here. <laughs> it's no fun. No fun at all. Uh, now, there have been exciting times to be fans of ripping in the past, uh, but I would dare say there has never been a more exciting time to be a fan of riffing than right now. <laughs> We've got uh, Rip Track still going strong as ever. We've got uh, Joel rebooting Mystery Science Theater. Uh, Frank and Trace are riffing. Uh, Mary Jo and Bridget are riffing. This is the best time since the show went off the air to be a fan of what you do. Well, isn't that wonderful? And it, I, I never expected, I didn't know how far it would go beyond the show. We had no idea. We all went off and started doing our own stuff after the show was over. And we found our way back to this because, I, I don't know, it's something we all enjoy. And it's something I think we're all pretty good at. And I think that's probably why it happened that way. Well, you, uh, you in particular, uh, you were, I believe, the longest-running cast member on the original show, and you've been with Rip Tracks since basically the very beginning. There's no more qualified riffer than you, so... <laughs> I, 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 I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, work with, I worked with all those guys uh, back in MST, and they were all fantastic and inspirational for me. And working with Bill and Mike is fantastic and always inspirational. I strive to stay up to their level of performance. Um, they're that good. But yeah, it is. I have that dubious distinction that I was involved with every single episode of Mystery Science Theater from the very first one at KTMA to the uh, very last one after which uh, they cut up the set and sold off chunks of it on eBay. So that's, that's a dubious distinction, I think. And then even between those, you were with the, the film crew. You did four episodes of riffing, and you worked on countless other projects, including uh, in the middle there, I have to take a tangent, you wrote my favorite book on cinema, A Year at the Movies, which is a, a really fascinating book, especially because I have come across this misconception that riffing is about hating on movies, but that book clearly demonstrates that you do have a love for cinema and, and a respect for cinema even if you enjoy having fun with cinema thank you yeah it is i don't know i'd say that it's it's about the love of cinema ultimately because we wouldn't make fun of these crappy movies uh unless they were crappy i mean not the way we do um and you know truth be told we have done on uh, riff tracks we've done jaws we've done casablanca uh, we've done uh, the Lord of the Rings films um, because we loved them, and it, it, it turned out for those to be more like a roast mm -hmm. than a you know a drubbing of the film. Whereas Twilight, Twilight was just like sweet yummy candy for us. <laughs> yeah. You certainly got a lot of mileage out of the Twilight franchise, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and <laughs> certainly a mileage just out of using the word line. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's their fault, you know. <laughs> of course. It's, uh, that's, we don't, these things, we don't pull these things out of the air. They set us up for it. They're, it's, uh, you know, as Trace said long ago, the movie is the ultimate Margaret DeMont for us. <laughs> the ultimate straight person, and we just take advantage of that. Not that I care, but where is your husband? Why, he's dead. I'll bet he's just using that as an excuse. Now, of course, uh, we all knew you well as Tom Servo, but you also played a handful of other roles over the course of Mystery Science Theater, uh, notably Professor Bobo. So I guess the real question is, which was more annoying, the ape makeup or holding a heavy robot over your head? Oh, the ape makeup, absolutely. <laughs> I remember one day, the, the worst of it was, um, early on we had this mask that was not adhesed to my face, which is bad enough. It also had a rubber strap that went around the back of my head. And uh, we spent 11 hours that day shooting and then doing production stills afterwards. I was in the mask the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and then on my way, I had taken off the mask and on my way home from the studio, I started experiencing my first migraine. And I nearly had to pull off the road. It was so bad. <laughs> I nearly blacked out when I walked in the front door, and it was all because of the mask. Well, we have our answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what was the worst that happened with Servo? Your arm fell asleep once or twice? Or... Yeah, he was a hefty little guy. And, uh, you know, it's just when you're trying to get a take just perfectly and his head falls off, that was always a frustrating <laughs> kind of thing. You know, It wasn't always funny when his head fell off. We were trying to get this shot done, and then suddenly Tom's head would fall off, and we'd go, shit! <laughs> 
Now, the, the biggest, uh, at least the biggest cosmetic difference between Mystery Science Theater and Rift Tracks was the lack of the robot characters, was uh, moving away from this framing story of being in space and just being three guys riffing on movies. And uh, I asked uh, Bill this in the past, but is do, do you notice any difference when you're writing material for a cute robot puppet versus when you're writing material for yourself to say? Oh, yeah, definitely. With the... With the puppet with the uh, you know a thing like a puppet you can get away with murder they can do anything you can kill them in one scene and then they'll be back in the next you can blow them up and then you just put them back together again um and they can say things they can get away with saying things that a human being can't it's sort of like the ventriloquist dummy thing is that a ventriloquist dummy can say whatever the hell it wants and in the right context it can get away with it whereas as grown men there we don't have as much latitude uh, to mock or to deride or uh, whatever um, you call that, uh, that a puppet can get away with, mm -hmm. really. A lot of things that uh, would be more too base and too immature for us to pull off as grown men. With Mystery Science Theater, your targets were mostly movies that nobody in your audience had seen before. You were discovering these, for the sake of argument, let's call them gems. <laughs> these, these, uh, <laughs> you, you were discovering these unknown bizarre pieces of culture whereas uh with riff tracks lately you've been going back and forth where you do do a lot of those b movies that you're showing to an audience for the first time but you also cover these big blockbusters that uh that your audience is quite well experienced with so what what are some differences in tackling a, a project like say roller gator that nobody's ever heard of versus a project like The Force Awakens where you know everybody's already been watching it and starting to form their own jokes in their heads. Well, uh, first of all, I really hated Roller Gator. <laughs> Lord, man, that film was awful. Um, so in some ways it was perfect for us. Well, like something like The Force Awakens, yeah. Half the world had already seen it. What? And we didn't want to just go back to the well of all the old Star Wars jokes that we'd done in the past. So first of all, with a, with a big Hollywood film, the way that they're made these days, the way they're built, is they're very loud. They're, the action scenes are very action-y, and the dialogue scenes are interminable when they actually start to talk. They don't shut up for a while. So that's a challenge just in the world of riffing to do something like that. But in particular for Star Wars, I think this one was fun because we sort of tried to, to take um, the attitude that we are not going to do as many references. We're going to just ob observe what's going on and have fun with that and not make it a bunch of jokes about things that had happened in Star Wars films in the past. Just sort of like, in, in some ways, in, in certain parts of the film, it's like somebody came down to the planet and has, is seeing a Star Wars film for the first time. And that was sort of what we were trying to get to there. So the jokes are not about, are not just references to the Star Wars universe. They're references to how goofy the scene looks if you look at it in a certain frame. I mean, come on, Kylo Ren. Yes. Folks. <laughs> Really? He's going to be in more of these things? And, and he's on billboards? And he's got, like, on the Disney thing, so they want children to go out there and buy collectibles that are based on a psychotic mass murderer who is an emo psychotic mass murderer who only wants to be loved. I, uh, make up your own minds, okay? Hate mail, send it to these guys. Send it to Geek Vision, not me. We accept your hate mail. Um, we, we welcome it with open arms. With covering the blockbusters, you get the opportunity to dip back into these franchises. Uh, very few of the B movies you tackle warranted a sequel. <laughs> a, a, a couple of them have. S some of them were sequels to begin with, but uh, by and large, when you're covering again Star Wars or Twilight or Harry Potter, you've got all these movies and. Uh, at a certain point, franchises they do start to uh, resemble themselves pretty closely. So, so when you're riffing like the latest Hunger Games movie, for instance, how how do you keep it fresh versus what you've the jokes you've already made for all the previous uh, movies in the franchise? I think that's the challenge: is to just forget all of the, instead of referring to the films that came before, refer to different perspectives of what you're looking at that uh, that come out of seemingly nowhere because they don't come out of having seen the other um, Mockingjay films, um, put it that way. And so, you know, just make fun of Woody Harrelson on his own merits, and I think you're going to be just fine there, you know. Just, I, I'm actually 
sort of looking forward to seeing now you what is it now you don't is that the sequel to now you see me <laughs> should be yeah yeah but uh yeah now you I'm saw sure. me <laughs> yeah is there a movie out there that you've just always wanted to riff and the opportunities never really come up well yeah here's the thing i'm excited about is that we're we're hopefully coming soon out of beta is the riff tracks player it's going to be an app that's going to it, it works great on android and it's coming for um for the iphones now um uh, and the thing that's wonderful about this is that if a if a film comes on in the middle of the night on your TV and you want to hear the riff for it, you can do it. Or if it's you know if it's on your uh, iTunes collection or you just want to rent it and stream it, uh, it's not like you have to get the DVD now and sync it up this way because the the app will sync it up for you. So this opens up a world of films that we couldn't do before. For instance, Daredevil, mm. the Ben Affleck Daredevil. We riffed it uh, live at Cobb's Comedy Club in San Francisco several years ago, and it was great. It's just perfect. But we couldn't release it because nobody owns a copy of Daredevil because I think they just don't exist. <laughs> and who the hell's going to spend even $5 on a copy of Daredevil just to hear our riff for it? Uh, not a lot of people. So it isn't worth it for us to do a just-the-jokes sort of riff for that uh, MP3. And it isn't worth it for us to pay the money... The, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars it would take to actually license the film to do it. So the Riff Tracks player sort of takes care of that for us. So we'll be able to do you know, it's all these 70s films and, and 80s films and 90s films that uh, are scarce on DVD, but they're you know readily available to stream. And you can queue it up in your in you know whatever streaming service you use and then you can download the riff for it and then play it whenever you want to which is kind of so i'm very excited about that it is going to open up a whole world of cheese that we haven't been able to tap into yet there you go it's, it's like having disembodio in your pocket That's right. exactly. uh now with the live shows uh you started out with the live shows mostly doing the easily accessible public domain yeah. Uh, material. Then, thanks to several successful Kickstarters, you've managed to get the rights to some pretty big films that, uh, like, when Riff Tracks started, I never expected that, thanks to Riff Tracks, I'd be paying money to see Roland Emmerich's Godzilla in a movie theater again. <laughs> and and, and na now there's this... Uh, you, you recently did Time Chasers Live, and the cast of Time Chasers was in attendance. So when you do these higher profile movies with with the uh, cast and crews who are still active and who are aware of what you're doing, do you still just approach it like like any old film or is there an added pressure thinking, well, I'm I'm making fun of the guy from Time Chasers in front of his face like it, it, <laughs> no 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 they they knew when they came into the theater what they were going to get into and uh, and I don't think we'd ever pull punches for that I I think we've we've matured over the years and, and instead of uh, we're not as mean as we used to be like on some particular quirk of someone mm. um, and we'd I think we'd much rather make fun of their performance than the person themselves sure. um, except when you got a chin like the guy in Time Chasers it's really hard to uh, but anyway, that's more of what we try to do, I think, these days, is to just have fun with their character, with their performance, with all of the goofy stuff that, that is entailed in that, rather than the person themselves. And the notable exception to that, of course, is that we've, uh, we've made our own version of Nick Nolte in the universe, who, <laughs> who doesn't really exist, but boy, we love that version of Nick Nolte, and Mike's so good at doing it. T to be fair... Everyone in comedy is required to have their own version of Nick Nolte. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> For the live shows in particular, you've also managed to have some pretty high-profile uh, guest riffers, uh, both for the Fathom live shows and for the live shows at uh, San Francisco Sketch Fest, which, yeah. which you release. Uh, now, who's the guest riffer that you just love to work with, uh, and you, either ha you guys either haven't reached out to them yet, or they just haven't been returning your calls? We haven't had a clunker. But bottom line, everyone, especially Sketchfest, has been so great at getting us. It's Cole Stratton and Janet Farney who mm -hmm. also riff with us on there. And uh, David Owen at the Sketchfest um, have just uh, gone out there and found people, and some people who never knew about us before, who then came on and did a great job. Um, I mean, there's so many. David Cross was fantastic. Bob Odenkirk actually sat down and uh, showed how skillful he is. He said, Look, do you mind if we work on the script a little bit? And we're like, are you kidding? Of course, Bob Odenkirk wants to work on a script with us. And it was great. It was really funny. And you realized what a serious... He's a very funny guy, but he's very serious about his work, which is kind of great. And Adam Savage, you know, mm -hmm. he do, he's not what you call... He doesn't 
pretend to be a professional stand-up, but he's very funny and he's very funny on stage. He's a great stage presence. Uh, and Hodgman's always fantastic. Kristen Schaal was great when we had her on. Uh, Eugene Merman is, he, he's, first of all, besides being one of the nicest people in the world, he's, uh, he's just got that fantastic voice. Mm -hmm. um, but the one that I keep going back to is Paul F. Tompkins. Of course. Uh, he is so good at it, and he works. He comes prepared. He knows what he's going to do. He do, always adds to whatever it is we're doing. So I'm always, I, I just I love it whenever we can have him on the stage with us. That was like a, a, a Twilight Zone where a supernatural thing never happened. Yeah. <laughs> like you kept waiting for the weird thing to happen. Like, nope. Just these sad people and their sad lives. Super slow zoom in to nothing. <laughs> now, I would be remiss if I didn't address your musical contributions to both Mystery Science Theater and the Rift Tones. Uh, attending the live shows, we often get to hear your songs uh, playing over the fake trivia slides before the movie starts. Right, right. The musical aspect you bring to it, uh, was that a deep-rooted passion in you, or do you just happen to have a great singing voice? Well, thank you. I, the singing voice, yeah, I, I, I was in choir when I was a kid. Um, I never really learned to read music, but I've always sung. My family, all of my family members sing. And, uh, and we're lucky enough between Mike and Bill and I, we all have our own musical talents um, that we've been able to bring bring to this. And uh, Bill's written some of my favorite riff tone songs. He wrote Sparkly Vampires. Yeah. He wrote Plans 1 through 8, which <laughs> is uh, one of my favorites too. And... Um, and uh, Mike, you know, it's phenomenal at, in Mystery Science Theater, and he's written a few of our uh, our sillier songs. He wrote a song for Carnival of Souls, which doesn't get heard nearly as much as it ought to. It's just hysterical. Um, but yeah, it's 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 fun and it's lucky, and we I wish we could do more of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping to do more as we go along. I liked it when we started doing um, songs that were based on some of the films we did we've done and uh, I'd, I'd love to be able to do more of those and hopefully we will within the uh, next six months or so. So the reunion special coming up June 28th, uh, the most riffers ever riffing together on stage at once, uh, the biggest gathering of Mystery Science Theater alumni since the uh, 20th anniversary Comic-Con panel. Now this is going to be another anthology of shorts, correct? Yes, there's going to be a whole bunch of shorts, um, different ones of us riffing together at different times. Um, and we will have a Riffapalooza at the end with everyone on, and I guarantee there will be surprises. We do love surprises, <laughs> to an extent. Good, good surprises. Yeah. That, that's right. We, we, we don't want to be surprised you're adopted or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, gather the entire country together just to tell them all that their parents don't really love them. <laughs> Not me. No, my parents love me. Well, you are the exception to the rule. <laughs> um, so the Mystery Science Theater uh, Rift Tracks, 10 years of Rift Tracks. That, that, is, that is amazing for, uh, it's amazing for any endeavor, but especially for an internet comedy endeavor to, to just have kept going that strong, to still be as good as it is, as good as it was when it started, if not better, uh, you've, just, just the amount of years you guys have been doing this, it's truly paid off. You're doing some of your best work. It's wonderful to experience. Uh, do you have any uh, anything else you'd like to tell us about coming up? Um, no, just uh, come to the show June 28th. See all of us back there on stage. I know we're all a little bit older, but we're better. You heard it here, folks. Uh, so be sure to check out that live show at a theater near you, and uh, it will be available for purchase sometime after that, I believe. Maybe, probably. Ah, I hope so. I'll 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 find out and cut that out if it's not true. <laughs> but, but come to the live show. It's more fun than seeing it in at home in your underwear. It is certainly more fun to see it uh, in a movie theater surrounded by fellow fans, just to see it happening live. So be sure to check out that live show when it airs. Uh, uh, follow Kevin Murphy on Twitter uh, at KW Murphy. At KW Murphy, yes. And uh, keep up with everything he's doing and the whole Rift Tracks gang is doing. Uh, and until next time, this is Dave signing off. Who you gonna get to rip those tracks? I don't have a big tracks, better rip some this year. Why you always gotta pick Rift Tracks? Rift Tracks, sign the tracks, but you never It's your lucky day, it's time for Rift Tracks.